Awesome. Hey, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending this panel and this conference. I um, hope you've enjoyed uh, the, the talks and, and the panels so far. I'm um, really excited to kick this one off. Um, I'm, I'm Atish. I lead our uh, content language engineering teams at scale, so addressing uh, annotation use cases in NLP, search evaluation, and uh, product cataloging. And excited to be here with, with Catherine and Julian. Um, and really, I think what's special here uh, in regards to NLP is Catherine as the head of Global IQ at Qualtrics, who, who leads um, engineering and, and ML teams applying NLP in Qualtrics products. Catherine, you really bring this uh, platform, or sorry, in this industry perspective um, on the use case and deployment of NLP solutions at, at enterprise scale. And Julian, uh, as the as the CTO of Hugging Face, uh, through the, the community-driven approach that you guys have done, really has been described as the most influential platform in modern machine learning. You really bring this platform perspective on kind of making the horizontal tools, uh, community medium uh, to democratize access to, to NLP models and data sets out there. Um, so really excited to have these, these uh, two perspectives. Um, and so just to kick off, uh, just, just to learn a little bit about your guys' backgrounds and what you do, Catherine, like many others in, in AI and uh, in machine learning, you really come from this deep uh, math background. And so how did your background lead you to uh, AI and NLP? Um, great. Well, thanks, Satish. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, my background started off with academic pure math doing geometric analysis and general relativity. Pen and paper math has nothing to do with NLP, as a matter of fact. Uh, so it's a little bit of a circuitous route. Um, I initially aspired to stay an academic, but then partway through realized that I felt very out of touch with what was happening in the world. And the impact of my work just felt like it was non-existent. You know, five people read your paper and then that's it. Um, and so I jumped into industry and sort of rode the, the wave of data science and, and machine learning as I went. And so that's what brought that's what's brought me here today. Um, and I'm really excited. My, my goal is to bring these like math and technology to life to have an impact in the world. And I'm in a good place to do that. Yeah. And, and tell us a bit about what your teams do at, at Qualtrics for those not aware. Sure. Well, first of all, Qualtrics is an experience management platform. And what experience management really means is helping companies of all kinds use experience data. That is to say the experiences of their customers or their employees or their prospective customers um, to be better versions of themselves, to have better customer experiences, have better employee experiences, etc. And a huge amount of that experience data is in text form. Think about, you know, some of it's in survey data, you know, NPS surveys, CSAT surveys, whatever. But an awful lot of it is in social media reviews or open in verbatims or just people writing out or, or saying their thoughts. And so part of my role at Qualtrics is leading the AI team that extracts that signal and really tries to understand those experiences at Qualtrics for the benefit of our customers. Awesome. And uh, uh, in Qualtrics and, and your past work, what's really changed about working with ML, ML and NLP um, over the years for you and, and your experiences? Oh, my gosh. It's a sea change. Uh, when I jumped to industry, it was 2012, which, as everybody knows now, was a huge year for uh, machine learning. But at the time, um, it was a blip on the radar. And in fact, because I was coming out of academia, I really just wanted to have an impact. So I sort of wanted to stay away from hype. And I really just focused on some of the simplest tools to do the job, you know, use logistic regression. Don't go to the, you know, big fancy stuff. If logis logistic regression will work, do that. You know, scikit-learn was our friend. And so over the years, as deep learning has proven that it can actually be really effective and even cost effective at solving some of these problems, it's just completely transformed the way we think about NLP from bag of words to transformer models today. It's just, it's entirely different. It's actually a hammer worth using now, whereas previously it was sort of more about the hype. Awesome. Um, and so turning out to Julian, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background and why uh, you and your team uh, started Hugging Face. Yeah, good, uh, good question. Um, so at, at Hugging Face, um, the whole like team has been like really passionate about machine learning for a long time now. Um, coming from kind of like diverse scientific backgrounds, um, like echoing what Catherine said, uh, my uh, co-founder Thomas Wolf. Um, was actually uh, doing uh, quantum physics. 
So kind of like different from, from machine learning, obviously, but also kind of like similar in some, in some sense. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we've been like really excited about machine learning um, and in particular natural language. Um, we started the company back in uh, 2016, which was uh, another uh, big year for, for machine learning and NLP in, in particular. Um, we started, uh, we started releasing a lot of what we were doing in open source. And uh, we, we've been like completely uh, uh, floored and completely impressed by the, the, the contribution of the community on top of the, the, of the code that we, that we released. And uh, we've been like super lucky uh, to be kind of like at the, at the center of this community of contributors from, um, uh, from scientists to machine learning engineers, kind of like um, building this community of people, super talented people working together to build the future of uh, artificial intelligence. Awesome. You know, you know, in, in this kind of short amount of time, uh, hugging face has really become the, a commonplace term for anyone doing NLP. And so why do you think this community driven open source approach really, really took off for you guys? Yeah, I mean, um, so like pretty simple uh, reasons, actually, if you think about it, like, you know, the, the big tech companies um, like the Google, Facebook, Microsoft, they've been doing incredible research in machine learning. Um, but that they, they haven't been that great at bridging uh, research to production. Like most of the times, um, the, the, the great projects that come out of their research labs, they kind of like, you know, uh, push it into the open and it's great, but uh, they don't invest in um, them over time. And so we've, we've, we've been lucky to be able to work like pretty early on with those teams and also a lot of other teams in smaller companies, in universities, um, over, over the world and kind of like, yeah, aggregating all, all those um, people doing great projects uh, and, and kind of like making, making them easy to use, easy to benchmark, easy to compare um, has been like a, has been a pretty, pretty, pretty cool uh, project. Really, really interesting. Yeah, it's kind of bridging this, uh, this research and production uh, uh, environments and, and really uh, making sure that developers on the production side are actually uh, empowered to use a lot of the cutting edge research uh, that is coming out. Um, and so I know uh, probably a lot of people in the audience are, are wondering, uh, audience in the world, why is it called Hugging Face? Uh, you have this really cute uh, emoji on your shirt. Um, why did you guys decide to name it that? Yeah, good, good question. Um, it's kind of a unique emoji in a way because, uh, I mean, it's an emoji. But at the same time, it's one of the of the few emojis that have uh, human features, uh, the hands, and uh, it's also giving like uh, basically like the most human of of uh, gesture, which, which is a hug. So it's kind of like uh, in the middle uh, uh, between you know like a robot and a human. So it's kind of like a good metaphor for what what machine learning is. Really unique, yeah. It really. Uh, it really allows you guys to, to stand out um, in, in names and become a, a commonplace term. Um, honestly, I thought it was something to do with the, the Unicode encryption of, of uh, that emoji, but I guess not. The real reason is so much better. Yeah, it's it's very, very symbolic. Uh, love it. Um, and so uh, moving on a little bit, the um, and, and this came up um, a lot in, in the rest of the uh, conversations in the conference today, really like the over the past year, advancements in NLP have really showcased that the acceleration of happening in research and uh, industry access uh, for both uh, developers and uh, ultimately end users. And so things like obviously GPT-3, adoption of transformers uh, with Hugging Faces open source library, self-supervision, Dolly, Clip, et cetera. Um, it really feels like we've uh, we've entered kind of a new era. And um, it does, I think, uh, Catherine, you mentioned this, it does, parallel what happened in computer vision in 2012 with the ImageNet challenge and, and the winning kind of AlexNet architecture, uh, which really kicked off this deep learning uh, revolution. Um, and specifically that the, this uh, ImageNet task allowed, um, it really showed that the pre-training of CV models uh, can learn general purpose features um, and ultimately achieve state-of-the-art results in 
new task in like that similar domain. And so with transformers and general language models, do you, many are saying that we've hit this like seminal ImageNet moment uh, for NLP. And so uh, for for both of you guys here, um, one, do you guys agree? Have we have we hit it? Uh, and the second thing is really why now? Like what what are some of the things that have come together to uh, make this possible? Well, I certainly agree that we're there. Um, I, I won't speak to the research side where obviously ImageNet opened up whole new avenues of research and problems and domains. Um, but at least for us now with transformer models and in a, in a NLP, it makes accessible a technology that just wouldn't really have been fully accessible to us for business applications otherwise. We can now quickly stand up classification algorithms that serve core business needs, and we can do it efficiently uh, with our team and with hardware uh, in ways that we just really could not have. That, that contribution just opens the door to being able to use this technology where it just wasn't previously. So it's a step function for us. Yeah, and same same feeling on my side. Um, I mean, we, we've kind of like entered this paradigm um, uh, shift where in NLP you used you used to kind of like um, train uh, a new model from scratch for every new use case that you wanted to achieve, and now uh, you take a pre-trained model, like a, a model that's been trained, a, a large model that's been trained on 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 a very large amount of data in a, in a self-supervised way. And then you fine tune it on a specific uh, use case and it works really well, right? Like this, this, this shift to models that are super large, pre-trained, and then you fine tune on specific use case um, has been taking off in NLP for the past two years and leads to a lot of companies uh, being able to deploy models that work way better than before for a fraction of the cost because you 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 basically just need to fine tune the model to your specific needs. It's also way more data efficient, like the, the, the amount of data that you the amount of annotated data that you need for your use case is is uh, way smaller. And so yeah, I mean um, um, we've seen a ton of companies uh where um nlp was more on the research side a few years ago and now are uh, it's it's really getting into production and 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 uh, they are like building a ton of like end customer value around around nlp right now yeah and a huge thing for qualtrics too is that um cross-lingual cross-language language models um, are just huge for us because only needing to fine tune with a small amount of data across all the different languages that our business touches, the Qualtrics is global, right? That's incredibly important for us uh, to be able to support our customers worldwide. Whereas previously building out individual models was just prohibitively time consuming and, and expensive. Yeah. yeah. And so th there's like these uh, trends coming in into play where um, the these large general language models actually require um, very large computation power as well. And so I, I'm curious, uh, uh, both Catherine and you, Julian, how do you guys see this um, uh, computation bottleneck uh, actually coming into play uh, when you're deploying uh, models into production? Um, so yeah, ob obviously, uh, most of those models are pretty large. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of of stuff happening on the optimization side. So like both like training and inference, which is uh, how, how you use uh, the model in production um, for a specific use case. Um, we've seen a, a ton of breakthroughs over the past few months in, in efficiency. So yes, you need a lot of compute, um, but we tr like the, the whole community is, uh, is in the process of making it easier and easier um to do that and and in a way that's uh, more and more efficient uh, on, on the compute on the compute side what's really cool so is that you used to train like before companies used to train those models for themselves and now we see this trend where a ton of companies are using pre-trained model but then also sharing their fine-tuned models so it's kind of like mutualizing uh compute uh, which is which is great i think 
Yeah, for us, I think the the compute changes have gone hand in hand with the improved accuracy that we get from language model based, you know, transfer learning. Um, so Qualtrics has for years run our hardware on prem. We have our own data centers that we take care of and so forth, um, CPU based. And so it had just never quite been worth it to buy GPUs or to extend to GPU based deployments in the cloud using hyperscalers until we got to um, some of the cutting edge models that actually give us the accuracy gains to make it worthwhile for business reasons. But as that technology arrived and we've discovered that we can actually get really you know, cutting edge accuracy when we use these techniques, it makes it worth it. So now we've switched to hyperscaler based deployments in the cloud for both training and inference. And that works out great. We have elastic scaling and everybody's, everybody's pretty happy. It works out nicely. Yeah, and so um, is it that uh, these hyperscalers are you're trading off um, compute for accuracy, or is it like, how are you thinking about the accuracy versus compute uh, trade off or curve um, here? Like when, after you have all these GPUs uh, running in the cloud? For us, I think it's a cost versus accuracy trade off. And so the increased cost of running in the cloud on GPUs is offset by um, to some degree, the elastic scaling that's provided, which is nice, um, but and it's completely made up for by the business value of being able to run, you know, high accuracy, say, sentiment and other types of classification models for the business because it's a key insight for our customers. So it winds up being worthwhile. Once the accuracy gets good enough, the cost is worthwhile. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Do you have anything to add there? Um. I mean, we, we've seen ton of uh, uh, companies, um, like a ton of companies have like different uh, production constraints and it's super interesting because there's a lot of diversity there, like depending on the type of model that you're running, depending on the latency or uh, regulatory constraints that you have, like uh, there's no like one size fits all solution. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty exciting because like bas basically we're, we are not overfitting to like one specific model, one specific way of deploying. There's this kind of like explosion of uh, of, of uh, different ways to do it, and uh, I think that's that's great because uh, we'll we'll explore more of, of the more of the space of uh, potential uh, things in the in the in the future. That's that's, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I, so I'm I guess pretty excited about. Oh, sorry, I'm pretty yeah, excited it, about uh, custom inference hardware as well. It's like uh, as as it goes, like a GPU is still very very uh, um, uh, general purpose device. So basically, you can do a ton of things. But it's not optimized for one specific uh, type of machine learning operations, for instance. And so, like a, a like. A number of uh, tech companies are working on like custom uh, inference chips. Um, can uh, can already kind of like play with them um, in in the cloud at the cloud providers. Um, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be inter interesting. And yeah, we we would love to help uh, facilitate the move to those kinds of like production devices if it makes sense, because that they're kind of like designed from the ground up for. Uh, this trade-off of uh, compute and accuracy that you that you mentioned. Yeah, and just to dig a little deeper, how how is, how do you face as like providing the software framework and layer, thinking about um, redesigning it or, or changing it uh, with these new hardware uh, hardware that's com actually coming out? How does that affect um, your your software layer here? Yeah, so we have a, a small uh, research team. Uh, that's working specifically on the technical subject of um, um, uh, sparsity, um, which is basically a, lo a lot of the parts of a large neural net, you can basically say it's just zero, right? So basically kind of like saying that this huge matrix of numbers, uh, you can pretty much get the same uh, accuracy if you just like um, turn like, 95% of the of the numbers into zeros um, because they are not the important ones. Um, if we find a way 
on specific hardware on the, on the, on the widest possible range of hardware to make it uh, 95% more uh, efficient, like faster, uh, with the same accuracy. I mean, it's going to be a, a game changer uh, in terms of uh, ML deployment. So we have a small team working on that subject. Um, yeah, like the technical subject is called uh, block, block sparsity and, and kind of like how do you train models that are going to um, uh, expose the, the right uh, amount of sparsity at the right spaces, at the right places, sorry. And how then do you make it efficient to run? That's really cool. That's like compression, the compression algorithms applied to the yeah. models. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of compression, yeah. Yeah, what's, so there are ton, tons of different uh, of, uh, ways of compressing a model. What's really cool with uh, block sparsity is that it's completely orthogonal to the other ones. So the gains mm -hmm. that you have on this on this side, you can pretty much multiply them by the gains that you have on other uh, more classical types of compression, like quantization, uh, distill knowledge distillation, stuff like that. Yeah, how, how does that relate to the uh, your, you, yourself, the, the work you did in 2019 around um, this distilbert method of, of really compressing uh, some of these models. Yeah, so it's 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 completely orthogonal. So that's nice because you can kind of like combine the the benefits of of all of the all of those approaches. So that's nice. Uh, obviously, like distillation. Um, um, is 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 great, but and, and it runs on all hardware. It's not like hardware specific. But if you go, if you want to go like uh, you know, like an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude deeper into efficiency, you kind of like need to do uh, to do to do to do stuff around like uh, deeper uh, architectural changes to the models. And Catherine, in your in production enterprise scale settings, are you thinking about uh, these distillation methods and, and shrinking down models, or is that not necessarily a factor you think about right now? I would say for where we are as a business right now, not yet. Right now, we're focused on getting product market fit uh, at a reasonable price and building up the models that are really going to help drive the business and satisfy our customers. And then I think at a, at a certain point, we'll kind of plateau and start looking at the costs and the margins and like, where can we do things more efficiently? Where can we fine tune? And, um, you know, at some point there'll be some diminishing returns. So we're not there yet, but we will yeah. at some point, I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, previously you actually mentioned that, uh, it's really great how far NLP has gone where you, you only have to think about, uh, NLP in these layers of abstraction now. Um, and so, uh, this was actually mentioned in one of the other talks with Francois Chalet around how um, TensorFlow is an attraction on top of the hardware and then Keras is another attraction on top. Like, Kelly, could, could you break down some of the attractions that, like, at, from a technical exec level that you have to think about in terms of um, designing NLP systems? Well, um... As an exec, I don't think about the layer. I mean, I think about the topmost layer of abstraction to me, which is can we build out a thing called an AI algorithm that does the following? And I think what's helpful here is that when you think about what really brings an algorithm to life, you have to have somebody like a researcher, a scientist, you have to have the engineering, the way to implement it, you know, to connect it with the business. And then you have to have the business reason. And they all have to be working closely in tandem. I call it a trifecta, right? In order to be able to actually make an impact. And in order to do that, there has to be a little bit of a closed loop. And so there have to be abstraction levels that the product manager, the, the person who's reflecting the business needs can understand and that you can um, quickly iterate. Can we get product market fit? Can we build an algorithm? Can we try it out? Can we, can we do something quickly? And what tools like Hugging Face provide is layers of abstraction that enable us to sort of quickly pull together some building blocks, some Legos, where we can say, hey, is this thing going to meet our business need? Right. And so I, as an exec, only need to know sort of that you can put some some shapes together that do 
what we need as a business. And then the team can go off and figure out how to sort of build it for real and fine tune it if that's what's necessary. So being able to abstract away from having hiring the people who know how to go deep into the technical, you know, deep neural network implementation and fine tune and tweak hyperparameters and build out just so and put it on this architecture before we even know whether it's going to really solve the business problem. That's incredibly useful to me. So the layers of abstraction that Hugging Face and others provide is is critical. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, uh, it seems like the main thing, the, the huge benefit here is like iteration speed um, and, and really um, uh, evaluating and confirming that this business problem is something that you need to do. Um, and going back to kind of uh, what we were talking about earlier around, so now we have these general language models that, that are pre-trained now, and then we have GPOs in the cloud and, and uh, computation is like, uh, is okay to have because we have now more more accuracy. So it, it seems like the the limiting factor, and this was discussed in uh, a lot of the previous talks, to limiting factor to neural net performance is really this domain specific data or data annotation that really is crucial to pre-training and fine tuning these models. And so both Catherine and, and Julia, I'm curious, are you also seeing this this data annotation bottleneck like now emerging since all these other uh, problems are somewhat solved? Yeah, that's uh, that's that's super interesting because um, kind of like counter to the intuition, you 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 could think that those large models they've been pre-trained on uh, self-supervised uh, sources of data, so basically you need less data uh, upfront, kind of, and then they are more data efficient to fine tune. So you, you need less data to fine tune them to a specific um, uh, use case. I mean, you need less annotated data uh, than, than you used to, to, to fine tune them to a specific use case. Uh, what's kind of cool is that we've seen that the need for annotated data has actually grown up um, because um, yes, for one specific domain, you need probably less annotated data. However, uh, as it's been easier and easier to fine tune more models, and also it's been easier and easier to actually, uh, as Catherine said, um, deploy them on, on, on business centric use cases. Um, people have started fine tuning more, more, more of those models. So kind of like moving away from annotating super massive data sets uh, that are kind of like low value to this more targeted approach of like annotated a ton of different pretty small data sets that you use to to fine tune like pretty specific models is, is what i've seen yep that tracks with exactly, I think, my perspective, which is maybe there's some sort of fundamental conservation of annotated data principle at play. Or maybe it's like once you have cheap and easy to get electricity, you come up with all kinds of electronic gadgets or something like that. Like now that it's easy to do, yeah, let's fine tune all kinds of different models for all the different like nuanced business cases where we can drive value. Yeah, let's do it. So yeah, I think I think we're we're continually going to continually going to be hungry there. I wouldn't say it's a bottleneck so much as taking advantage of an opportunity though. Yeah, I would say it's, le it's less of a bottleneck now because uh, you can start iterating with uh, way smaller data sets. Yeah, um, so Yeah. Yeah, when, when before you, you kind of like were limited by the, the need to kind of like construct a super big data sets of, I don't know, like uh, um, 100,000 uh, samples before being able to even see if it was going to work uh, or not. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's less of a bottleneck now, but it's more of uh, an enabler of, uh, of new cool use cases. And I feel like also the, the iteration cycle of uh, labeling, training, labeling, training, I mean, labeling training uh, using in production, labeling training using in production has, has gone like way, way uh, faster and more seamless, which is which is great. Yeah, yeah it, that kind of parallels what uh, we're seeing in the market where uh, a lot of customers are asking for this like really fast uh, experimentation platform uh, for getting 
uh, label data and really, really quickly <laughs> as well. Uh, and uh, that is just a shift from what we what was done before, where it's like you compile these huge, ma massive data sets and then train uh, somewhat offline and then come back uh, and then iterate, where now it's like really small packets of data uh, and you just mm -hmm. need them really quickly. Um, yeah, Catherine, uh, relate to what you said around electricity. It is very much like uh, Moore's law where um, there was uh, optimization computing and, and uh, transistors on uh, a specific chip and how many you can fit on there, but that didn't really reduce the computation and, and chip market. It really honestly just increased it because mm -hmm. the big thing is that there are just a lot more problems to solve now, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Um, yeah, so shift the years a little bit. But going back to Catherine, what you said um, earlier around uh, language coverage. Um, so uh, it seems like, like user applications are global. Uh, coverage in English, um, like many other languages, is not that much of a concern. We're with, through transfer learning, we we can confident that we can take a, a German model and retrain it for French, let's say. But I mean, how? How confident are we in like non-European languages, like low resource languages, uh, like Malay, Bengali, and, and, and others? Um, and so Julia, I'm actually curious from your perspective, uh, how are you seeing companies solve um, low resource languages um, in NLP today? Um, well, the thing is that probably like the business use cases uh, are kind of like lagging because like a lot of companies they used to focus for first on you know like the maybe 10 most popular languages um which is bad right because if you do that you kind of like uh, perpetuate this 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 circle where uh, less resources are going to uh, go into um already kind of like low resources uh languages so um we, we, we try to um, foster the community um, and to kind of like uh, uh, take the, the role of, um, of building this community where uh, there is a focus on increasing the diversity and the coverage of, of those models. Uh, we've been like super lucky to work with uh, tech companies that have, that have been like providing uh, compute, for instance, uh, we are in the process of um, um, doing like a very big community event uh, where community members uh, fine tune um, speech recognition models. So speech to text models in I think 80 or 85 uh, different languages. And what's super cool is that some of those languages, we couldn't find any public machine learning model to do speech to text on them uh, up to up, up to now i think that's uh yeah that's great you know just like a, a speech to text uh, outside of maybe 20 25 languages um just there were no 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 models until now so if we can help uh, the community to uh, experiment with those models we are kind of like breaking the loop of of um more, re more resources going uh, into already resource-rich uh, languages. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, I know you, you mentioned this earlier, but how, how are you guys thinking about like Qualtrics as a global company, like um, addressing a lot of these ML and NLP use cases in, in so many languages? Well, two things. One is this is absolutely a place where industry follows research. I think we're, we're leaning on the research community to sort of help figure this out and we will try to fast follow with whatever they find. And number two, that's because we're driven by business needs. So, you know, our global footprint is expanding into regions um, where I think customers have some expectations for these tools. So in a lot of places, we're not necessarily being asked to fill gaps for low resource languages, which is great for now, but I think we will quickly get to a point where we, we need to figure out solutions. So I'm hoping that Julian and the community will uh, come up with all the answers and then we'll use them. Yeah, I mean, particularly Julian, you mentioned the models, but what about the, the data sets in these different different languages? like? How do you think about the community-driven approach uh, for that? Um, yeah, so like we're building a lot 
on um, the data sets that have been built by the community. Um, like to give you, uh, to, to continue with the example of, uh, of speech to text, um, the, the community event that we are doing right now is uh, based on um, a data set called uh, Common Voice that has been uh, built by a ton of like different volunteers under the leadership of Mozilla. So it's like a Mozilla project. Um, um, like great contributors have been like basically uh, reading text um, and, and we get to like, um, and they released what, 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 they've been, what they've been reading. And so we, we've kind of like have this great data set of like, I don't remember the number, the number of uh, hours of, of recorded speech, but it's pretty unique, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I particularly like the, the, the data set marketplace that Hugging Face has opened up in addition to your, your models marketplace, because uh, uh, even even the language I speak, uh, Gujarati, which is a somewhat archaic Indian language, like there are so many different data sets that I didn't know existed uh, that I found through Hugging Face's marketplace. So. That like community-driven approach is is working. And, uh, surfing that is is kind of working. Um, we're, we're heading towards towards uh, time here, but um, I want to give a chance to ask one of the questions from the audience. Um, so was, uh, the question was asked: uh, What are some of the biggest uh, weaknesses in your mind of uh, transformer models in NLP today, and how are we trying to, uh, as a community research industry, uh, overcome them? Maybe a question for um, you want to go first. Oh yeah, I can I can maybe maybe go first. Um, yeah. Um, in my mind, those models are still uh, too too hard to use at scale in production. Um, they're also kind of like hard to train, hard to fine tune. So there's there's a lot of things that we can still do to make it easier and easier to, to train, to fine tune, and then to run. So like a lot, a lot of the things that we are going to build in the next uh, couple of years are going to revolve around, around that. Um, and obviously, I mean, the, the, the models, like there's a ton of research on, on how to improve those models. Um, um, so I, I think that we are still at the beginning of, uh, of, this, of this curve. Um, it's going to be like super excited, exciting to see what's going to happen. But uh, yeah, I feel like we are, st are still like a, a lot of progress to make on, on those on those models. Yeah, very much, very much day one, uh, essentially. Right? Mm -hmm. um, Catherine, anything to add there? Yeah, I don't know that I have any complaints about existing transformer models. I think we're pretty excited about being able to use them in the ways that we are. Sure, if they could be cheaper and easier to use, I would certainly take that. So yeah, let's do that. Um, I think I'm particularly interested in the next wave of, of research on embedding more structure so that rather than being, um, some of the, the, the discussion on GPT-3 has talked about how its understanding is shallow and where we can embed a little bit more reasoning into some of these. I, I think that will be a very, very interesting next frontier. and. When it gets there, I'll be happy to try to make use of it for business applications. Yeah, um, and particularly on this like shallow point, like uh, it seems like one one trend we're seeing is that um, moving some of the uh, or using some of the context from text definitely, but also uh, using a lot of the context from vision and audio inputs for uh, multimodal data and multimodal um, models. And so uh, I'm curious, is multimodal uh, learning and, and models being used in practice or is that still uh, something that's being uh, explored? For us in our applications, not yet. I can imagine use cases where it would be, but I think we got to nail the individual pieces, the, the modes one at a time before one we go. One mode for at, at a yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that there are some pretty interesting possibilities there. So Julian, when, when will we have all the multimodal goodness? Hopefully soon. Um, I mean, I, I agree that it's still uh, more on the research side. I haven't seen like a ton of like um, uh, applications or uh, yeah, companies using uh, multi-models uh, models 
uh, right now. But uh, yeah, it's definitely something to something to follow. To kind of like uh, uh, follow on your uh, on the topic of like struct structured data, uh, putting more structured data into NLP into machine learning. Um, one of the models that I've been like super impressed with uh, in the past uh, few months is uh, this this model uh, from Google called uh, Tapas. And what what's it uh, what what it actually lets you uh, do is um, basically not only query tables in natural language, but also act actually do like uh, you know computation like you can ask for the sum of um, of you know like uh, uh, sum of the number of words in a document or a sum of the of uh, or average. Um, uh, value of specific like uh, piece of data that you find from Wikipedia or stuff like that, and it actually computes them. So that's really awesome. Um, it's it's still like I mean it's still you know like a, a statistical um, model. Uh, obviously, uh, we are we are very far from having like you know actual intelligence inside the model. But I felt like it was like one of the one of the demos where. I was like super impressed, and uh, yeah, I feel like uh, the, the the business opportunities of using those kind of models uh, are are basically endless. Endless. Yeah, can't wait for that to come into Google Sheets or or Excel or something like that, just to reduce uh, formula making. Yeah, there are a lot of <laughs> out there on the frontiers of research that I think could come together over the next era, like automatic theorem proving and, and this kind of technology, and like, a, like reasoning could come into play. I don't know, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean, two particular examples of that is like uh, with these uh, large self-supervised uh, models trained on uh, very large internet sources, we're, we're seeing them learn, for example, uh, the, the periodic table of elements from millions of scientific journals or really writing code uh, through through clever prompt engineering. Uh, and pretty, I, I find those, Pretty fascinating, uh, just because no one really intended to make that happen, but it, it is now uh, now happening. Um, so, uh, curious uh, as a, as a closing note, do you guys foresee models being used successfully in these very like open ended ways, or still like fine tuned and trained uh, for specific tasks? I've been surprised by what is possible a few different times over the course of my career now as an AI observer and practitioner. So I don't know, but it seems like it's at least plausible. It will, yeah. Yeah, I think that in in, uh, in real world systems, uh, people are already kind of like mixing, mix and matching uh, deep learning models with other types of uh, systems. So kind of like this vision of uh, of uh, like the next generation of of machine learning and and software engineering as this kind of like meshed uh, subject mm -hmm. uh, where some parts are uh, machine learned and some parts are more kind of like traditional uh, computer science is uh, is something that it's it is it's very exciting but it's also kind of like already the case in some form. Uh, as soon as you kind of like put those machine learning models um, in inside inside the other complex systems, I think that's uh, yeah. I think we, we are going to see more and more and more of those uh, types of uh, complex systems that are going to yeah. achieve like pretty pretty cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. It'd be amazing if uh, every system just takes natural language as input, whether or not it's generating images, audio, or or videos or anything. It'd be great to just, for example, generate. Uh, stock images just from from text as uh, as we see yeah 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 months. i mean uh, natural language is uh, basically the the api of humans right exactly yes yes well great great way to end uh end this presentation and in session uh natural language is the api for humans um thanks so much catherine and and julian uh for taking the time uh to chat with us today and hopefully you guys learned a lot too it's been a pleasure Thank you. Thank you.